Today we're talking about potentially the biggest opportunity and in innovation right now. This stock plans on disrupting a behemoth of an industry that hasn't seen any real innovation in over a hundred years. And as we all know around here, with great innovation comes great gains. Let's do it. What's going on everybody? My name is Matthew. Welcome back to my channel and today we are talking all things Lemonade. Lemonade is an AI based insurance company that hopes to disrupt the industry of insurance. And in just a second, you'll know exactly why this is such a big opportunity. Give me the format. First, we're going to set the scene and explain why disrupt insurance and what's Lemonade's strategy to disrupt. Second, a deep dive into Lemonade's actual product. Third, their performance thus far over the past few years and some of their financials. Fourth, how Lemonade will achieve sustained growth. Fifth, the risky risks involved. And finally, sixth, what am I going to do? Now we have never had six parts to one video before on this channel, but it is with good reason because I believe we're going into some serious details that are not only very important, but I don't think I've seen anyone else explain these on YouTube. Let's get into it with part one, why the insurance industry and Lemonade's strategy to disrupt. We'll start with the three main reasons why the founders of Lemonade think the insurance industry is ready for massive disruption. First, it's huge. Second, it's unchanged. And third, it's unloved. Let's break this down. The first disruptive opportunity is that the insurance industry is absolutely huge. According to Lemonade, insurance accounts for 11% of US GDP and it's a $5 trillion market worldwide. And not only that, there's also lots of room for many different insurance companies to thrive in this space because no one insurance company has more than 4% control of market share. For example, Allstate, who made over $44 billion in revenue last year and is obviously a dominant player, but doesn't own more than 4% of the global insurance market. But before we get too excited, here's a little red flag. These numbers, after all, are from Lemonade's presentation, so I tried to verify for myself to see if insurance really is 11% of US GDP, because that's a lot. Here's what I found. The Insurance Information Institute said insurance and related activities only accounted for 2.9% of US GDP in 2019, and that's sourced from the US Department of Commerce, which sounds pretty trustworthy. That is a lot less than 11%. But hold on tight because these numbers are all over the place. Another source said that insurance was 8.9% of US GDP in 2018, but even still notice how it never got close to 11%. And the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis had insurance as 7.6% of US GDP in Q1 of 2020. I couldn't find a source that confirmed the 11% GDP that Lemonade gave, and I said this is a red flag, but really it's just a reminder to verify all the stats you hear, especially if it's coming from a company that wants you to invest in them. But enough of that because in the end, insurance is a massive market opportunity nonetheless. So let's move on to the second disruptive opportunity. It's unchanged. The average age of the biggest insurers in America is 125 years old. And let's visualize 125 years old real quickly. 125 years ago, this car was top of the line, absolutely premium stuff. 125 years later, this is the top of the line. So it's evident that the last 125 years, cars improved dramatically. But what about the insurance for these cars? Unless you count innovation as making funnier commercials, nothing really disruptive has happened in the insurance industry. It's time for someone to stir the pot. Or should I say lemonade? Pitcher. And finally, the third disruptive opportunity that the founders of Lemonade saw is the insurance industry is, quote, deeply unloved. People, especially millennials who are Lemonade's target demographic, generally do not love the big bad insurance companies. They're perceived as boring or deceitful, and they often require lots of time on hold for customer service. Now this is the narrative that Lemonade paints, a lot of deceit or gamesmanship between big insurers and normal people, and I feel like they embellish or exaggerate a little bit. But nonetheless, Lemonade has a very unique and rare opportunity to get people excited about a new product in an old industry an unloved industry. And this may seem like a bunch of marketing, but this is actually a really big deal because if your current competition is old and disliked, your new never before seen product will be a no brainer. Customer acquisition will come easily. It's like if you're a 20 year old girl and you're dating a mean grumpy old man because he's your only option. Then Prince Charming from Shrek pulls up and he asks you out. 
it doesn't take much convincing to go with Prince Charming and leave the old man. To clarify, the old man is old insurance and Lemonade is Prince Charming. So those are the three key reasons why insurance is picked as the opportune industry to disrupt. Now let's talk about the Lemonade strategy for disruption, which I'll explain in less than 30 seconds. Starting now, it starts here by delighting customers. This means exceeding their expectations with quick claims and easy purchases. Delighted customers means quick word of mouth. Word of mouth generates fast organic growth. Fast growth means fast data collection for Lemonade's AI and their predictive data strategy. More data means faster machine learning, which means faster and more accurate pricing from Lemonade. This new and speedy pricing delights customers once again because they're now getting even better and more accurate prices and the whole thing starts over again. This cycle is pretty much identical across most companies that use machine learning. More customers means more data, which means better machine learning, which translates into more customers. It's just never been used in insurance in this way. So that's why they chose insurance. That's Lemonade's game plan. Let's talk about part two, their product in detail. To understand how Lemonade is different, we must understand first how normal insurance providers work. For insurance, you pay what's called a premium, and this is just the price of your insurance policy. If something goes wrong, you have the right to file a claim, and that claim, if approved, will come out of your premium. But if nothing goes wrong and you never file a claim, then the insurer pretty much gets to keep all of your premium as revenue. And of course, it's much more complicated than this, but hopefully this gives you the gist. But with Lemonade, when you pay your premium, instead of taking all of it and only paying it out when necessary for a claim, Lemonade just takes a flat 25% fee of your premium and the remaining 75% is dedicated solely to paying out any future claims. And if you don't make any claims, any remaining premium that hasn't been used will be donated to a nonprofit of your choice. That all sounds great, and for the most part it is, but I wanna take a deeper dive. Let's take a closer look at something called reinsurance and how Lemonade uses it strategically. Reinsurance is a really important part of Lemonade's operations. Reinsurance is when insurance companies share their risk by purchasing insurance policies from other insurers to limit their own risk. In other words, it's like insurance for insurance companies. In this case, Lemonade gets reinsurance from insurers like Berkshire Hathaway. And reinsurance is crucial to Lemonade's business for three main reasons. One, it offloads risk. Two, it stabilizes revenue. And three, it actually frees up capital to use for growth. How, you may ask? Before we continue, I'm gonna need you guys to lock in because it's about to get kind of wordy. Okay, let's do it. Lemonade is in a partnership structure called proportional reinsurance. This means that the reinsurer, for example, Berkshire Hathaway, will receive a percentage of the premiums that Lemonade sold and pay the same percentage of the claims. So when Lemonade sells an insurance policy, they collect the premium, pocket the flat fee of 25%, and then Lemonade transfers or seeds or gives the remaining 75% of their premiums to their reinsurers. The same reinsurers must also cover 75% of the claims, in other words, 75% of the risk. Oh, and of that 25% of premiums seeded to the reinsurer, Lemonade collects 25% of every dollar seeded as commission. So in explaining this proportional reinsurance relationship, I've explained how it offloads risk for Lemonade and also stabilizes their revenue. How? Let's recap. Lemonade gets paid a premium. They collect 25% of that premium automatically, flat fee, every single time. That's the stable revenue. Then they pass on the remaining 75% of that premium to the reinsurer, and thus the reinsurer takes on 75% of the risk. That's the offloading. But I also said that reinsurance frees up capital for Lemonade to use for growth. Without reinsurance, Lemonade's risk for having to pay out bigger or more frequent claims becomes much higher. Therefore, by law, they would be required to have at least 50 cents tied up in cash reserves for every $1 of premium sold. This is also known as the two to one ratio. For example, if Lemonade sold $10 of premium, they'd be required to have $5 of cash tied up in cash reserves. And this is so Lemonade would always have enough money to pay off at least the majority of their claims. But because of reinsurance, like we just said, a lot of risk is offloaded. So the risk of Lemonade having to pay out big claims or frequent claims is much smaller. And therefore, Lemonade is only required to have a seven to one ratio, meaning they only need about 14 cents tied up in cash reserves for every $1 in premium sold. A big difference from 50 cents. 
This of course means they'll have less money tied up in cash reserves than they usually would and they can then spend that on growth. And if this didn't make sense, please, I, I suggest you rewind and try and understand it because I think it's a pretty cool system that Lemonade has figured out. Now on to part three, Lemonade's performance for the past few years and a bit of their financials. Let's break down their performance starting with the sign up process and the premiums. All you have to do to sign up is text AI Maya, Lemonade's AI bot. Within minutes, just after a few questions, Maya will give you a quote for your insurance premium and you can decide if you want to sign up or not. Now when Lemonade first started, they were losing a lot of money on premiums and paying out claims because I assume Maya was not very good at her job yet because she didn't have enough data. I'm basically assuming that because Maya had a lack of data, she was probably giving out premiums that were not in the best financial interest of Lemonade. The key metric to follow and focus in on here is called the loss ratio. The loss ratio is the losses an insurer incurs due to paid claims as a percentage of premiums earned. Here's an example. If Lemonade collects $160 in premium but pays $80 in claims, their loss ratio is 50%. Well, back in 2017, Lemonade started off with a 368% loss ratio. This means they were collecting way less in premiums than they were paying in claims. But over the years, as the AI got smarter and got more data, Lemonade got it down to just 72%. I think now the most recent number might even be 79%. But I keep this yellow and not green because 72% is still relatively high. The average loss ratio for an insurance company is between 40 and 60%. So Lemonade still has some work to do. Now, despite a relatively higher loss ratio, it has been declining steadily year over year. And while it's been declining, their enforced premium has been climbing steadily and quickly. Enforced premium or IFP is just equal to the number of customers times the average premium per customer. So in Q1, for example, 730,000 customers times an average premium of $183 equals $133 million in IFP. This gives Lemonade a 450% compound annual growth rate over the last three years, which is, eh. no, I'm just kidding. That's pretty flippin' stellar. A quick look at their financials tells us they've got about 399.9 million in total assets and 124.3 million in total liabilities. Not bad. But just be aware, they are still losing lots of money. In 2019, they had a net loss of 108.5 million, and in Q1 of 2020 alone, they had a net loss of 36.5 million, so keep an eye on that. And yes, I understand that the culture now is to spend a lot of money up front as a growth company to get aggressive expansion and market share, but just make sure that the company is allocating capital responsibly. Moving on to part four of this video, guys, we're almost there. How will Lemonade sustain long-term growth? I think one of the most compelling points made by Lemonade is their idea of growing with their customers. About 70% of Lemonade customers are under the age of 35 and they start off with something small like a $5 renter's insurance policy. But as these customers grow in age, their premiums will naturally grow in price. From the younger ages like 20, 25, and 30, Lemonade's customers will experience very predictable lifetime events like, for example, going from renters to homeowners insurance. If Lemonade can capture a young generation of customers now, they'll only appreciate in value moving forward. And Lemonade is the perfect product for millennials and Gen Zers. These generations want convenience. Great, just text AI Maya and she'll get you a quote within minutes. These generations want instant gratification. Great. AI Jim, Lemonade's claims bot, will grant and often approve your claims within seconds. These generations have such low attention spans that being on hold for customer service is literally torture. Great, most of our automated services make it so there's not much need for person-to-person -person customer service. And beyond just growing with their customers, Lemonade still has huge opportunity to grow into different countries. And they also have opportunity to grow the different insurance policies they offer. Right now, they're primarily focused on homeowners and renters and pet insurance, but they'll obviously expand into other insurance policies like auto, life, health, umbrella, all that good stuff. But here is part five to ruin the party, the risky risks involved. One, there is no concrete path or timeline to profitability. Two, I personally think that their 25% flat fee business model limits their potential revenue. I would like to see them collect more premium just beyond 25%, but I guess that would expose them to more risk and also it wouldn't be that much different from a normal insurer. So 
I'll let this one slide. Three, they are yet to show results for how they can handle their first big natural disaster and whether or not their AI bots can handle that kind of chaos. We are yet to see a massive event wipe out a bunch of homes that are insured by Lemonade. God forbid that ever happened, but I'm just saying there is a lot that remains to be stress tested. But again, after reading their S1 filing, it seems like Lemonade is pretty aware about how they are limiting their risk and how much at max they're willing to pay for a claim. And finally, number four, probably the most realistic risk is a big time competitor coming into this space. I don't think any of the big players like Progressive or Allstate are nimble enough to just whip up an AI solution and immediately begin competing with Lemonade. However, they do have the ability to acquire a startup and task that startup to compete with Lemonade. And I think this is a very possible and real risk. But of course, Lemonade has the first mover advantage and tons and tons of data. And so they're very far ahead of any potential competitors. All right, so the final part of this video, part six, what will I do? You can't deny that this company is innovative and disruptive. And I think they've found the perfect industry to disrupt. But there are still a lot of unknowns, not only, for example, the natural disaster situation where we don't know how they can handle that, but also just in the stock market. We don't really know what kind of valuation that Wall Street likes for this stock yet. It's only been IPO'd for a month. Ultimately, however, I do see myself starting a position, a potentially big position in Lemonade because it is a rare opportunity for true innovation. A lot of growth stocks that claim to be innovative are only 10 or 15% more innovative or better than the current solution. But I think Lemonade, what they're doing has potential to be truly 10x what is happening and what is the current solution right now. If you found any value in this video, and I hope you did, please make sure to hit that like button, subscribe, and read our quote of the day. You might just learn something. Make sure to go follow me on Instagram for daily posts about my portfolio, stock news, and all that good stuff. If you're watching at this point in the video, thank you so much. You are the real MVPs. Don't forget your peace and thank yous.